Okay, welcome. Uh, this week's lesson, we continue in Acts. We're kind of making a transition at this point. We're, we're going to be looking at chapters 10 and 11 with a focus on chapter 10, verses 34 through 48. But we're making a transition from uh, the ministry of Paul to the ministry of, uh, of Peter. And so we got a little change of place where they're at and a, and a little change of what's going on and being said. But in seeking the context, the author of our lesson here, he started out with there is only one race, the human race. Every human being is a product of God's creation, created in the image of God, which we know that. We understand that and we believe that. It says here too, Paul also said that God had created and arranged the entire human race on the earth. So sometimes we want to remind people around us that you know, God created all of us. God created not just a group that you want to pick, but God created everyone. He created everything. So there's nothing that we see, feel, hear, touch, smell, look at. There's nothing around us in our world that God did not create. And we should show reverence to God for his creation. But he, he says here that the Lord wants every human being to find him and to be saved. We understand that. We believe that. And then he goes on to mention, he says, calling it what it is, racism is sin. Prejudice of any type is sin. So we need to remind ourselves of that. We need to remind those around us. We need to live our life so that those around us see that we don't exhibit any prejudice towards anything or anybody. But we're going to get into to that in today's lesson. And one other thing, comment that he made in here, he said like most Jews, Peter was a bit hesitant to, hesitant to think that the gospel was as much for the Gentiles as it was for the Jews. This, this lesson, the title of this week's lesson is the Gentiles receive the gospel. And what we're going to see here is Peter expanding his ministry and being directed by God and to go into areas that he hadn't necessarily thought about or necessarily even believed should go into. But we're going to pick up with, well, before we go into these verses, a little background for those that might not have had an opportunity to read through all the verses of, of these two chapters and instead of just the... Um, the focus. But beginning in Acts chapter 10, we meet Cornelius, who is a centurion, and he was also devout, and he was a God-fearing Gentile of Caesarea. And an angel of God appeared to him and commanded him to send for Peter at Joppa. So that's what he's telling us here in this introduction to kind of get us filled in on, on where we're at and what's going on. So then at the same time, the Lord showed Peter a vision. So Peter was in this other, in Joppa, and he was told to go to this tanner's house and go up on the roof. And the Lord showed him a, vi a, a vision. It was like a sheet that came down from the heavens. And it was covered with all kinds of animals and, and critters and birds of the air. It was filled with all kinds of things. And it was filled with clean animals and unclean. You remember... Peter, like all the disciples, they were Jews. They were raised as Jews. They had all these laws. They had clean things and unclean things. And you didn't touch, you didn't eat, you didn't you didn't have anything to do with the unclean. And you had to be very devout and very disciplined to to keep yourself clean and keep yourself in a manner that you could present yourself to the Lord. And so here this vision came down. And a voice came to him. This was God speaking to Peter. And he said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. So he's telling him that these, all of these things are, are available for him to eat. The Lord showed Peter all manner of animals and commanded him to kill and eat. Peter initially refused because this was unclean food according to Jewish dietary laws. So here we have God giving a command, God telling us, what we're supposed to do, and he's like, well, wait a minute, I know, you know, I know better. Peter's telling God he knows better. These are unclean. I'm not supposed to do that. Well, 
who who are we to be telling God that we know better and we know what's right and what's wrong? But the voice of the Lord said, What God hath cleansed, thou call not thou common. God tells him, What I've made clean, you can't say it's not. You can't say it's common. What I have told what what I say is okay is okay. What I say we do, we do. That's what God's telling him. <clears throat> There's Things have changed. That's what God's telling him here about this food. But what he's trying to do is to tell him these preconceived notions that he has, these things, they're no longer bound by the law. Jesus Christ has come. Jesus Christ lived a life on this earth as a sinless man. He died on the cross for every one of our sins. And now we're in a different day and age. And God's explaining to him, this is a different time. This is a different age. Uh, well, it says, although the message of this vision was not immediately clear to Peter, what he would eventually understand is that God was about to send him to the Gentiles with the gospel. I remember going one time, we all, Phil Robertson, before there was Duck Dynasty on TV, he had all these videos, duck hunting videos, and the boys and I enjoyed watching, he had a duck hunting show on television, and he had these videos, we enjoyed watching these, and the bottom line was he was going to be in Hope. And this was many years ago. So we all loaded up and went to the church in Hope to meet him, to see him. And it was a, a dinner at this church. But what he, what he was doing, it was his method and his way of spreading the gospel and sharing the gospel with people. And he was a fascinating person to listen to. He got to the. He was. He started it out like I'm going to give a duck call demonstration. I'm going to talk about duck hunting, and and, 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 and he and he took that and he started sharing the gospel with people as he went. He got to the point where we don't want to hear any more about this duck hunting stuff. Just tell us what tell us what you got. And he was fascinating. But he talked about this was one of the. You know, you see these t-shirts too, also that say "Rise, Kill, and Eat," and that's you know he he used this verse and he was he used it for. The obvious thing that comes out front that these are okay for you to eat these things, and that's what he's saying. You know, well, God told me that I could go and hunt and eat these things, but but it's also God's telling us things. God has a lot of times two things that He wants us to learn about something. He tells us something, and we see the obvious, but then He's got something more, a little more in depth that He wants us to learn from and understand. And so we pick up in verse 34 through 36. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is the Lord of all. So when Peter says here that God is no respecter of persons, he, it says here that he's using a word that literally means to receive a face or prefer the outward appearance of a person. He's talking about racism here. He's talking about God is not a respecter of persons, meaning he doesn't choose one over the other. He doesn't show more towards <coughs> one group than he does another. And you can break people up into all kinds of ways. Uh, again, I'm not an expert. I'm not professing to be anything like that. But if you go and you look up the word racism, because that's what he's telling us here. He's saying he used the word, uh, this clearly indicates racism. So if you go and you look up the definition today, you might get a little confused. It, 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 it doesn't seem to me to be as concise as it. Right here he says, Favoring people based on their skin color, nationality, culture, language, gender, economic status, or other reasons based on appearance. Racism, the word, did not exist when God inspired man to write this down. This is a word that we've come up with in the last few hundred years, racism. And if you go and you look up the definition of racism, they, they kind of narrow it down a little too much for what we what it really means. It's not just about one color of people, 
oppressing another color of people. That is a part of that. That is racism, but racism is not that narrow. Racism is 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 it can be expanded to include a lot of things. Like I said, it's favoring people because of their skin color. Okay, we all know that and we get that. It's favoring people because of their nationality, what country they're from. It's favoring people because of their culture, how they were raised. You know, you go to different parts of the United States. We're all Americans. We're all in the United States. We're all this. We're all Americans. We're united by that. But then when you talk about, it's it's like having a brother. I've got a brother. Fake and Lane are brothers of each other. I fought with my brother all the time when we were growing up. Some people think we still do, but we don't. <laughs> Fake and Lane, they mess with each other, and they jack with each other, and they always have, and they always will. But if somebody else tries to, that's the end of it. They're united as one. Nobody ever is going to do anything. Nobody's going to jack with my brother, and he ain't going to let anybody bother me. He was an older brother, and he's very protective when we were in high school, but everybody understands that concept. It's one thing when you're talking about your own. It's something else when somebody from outside comes in. So, like here in the United States, we're brought together as a whole when it's somebody from outside our borders. But when you're talking about, you know, I'm driving down the road, coming home, and if I see a Texas license plate, I just, oh, here we go. These people don't know how to drive. If you're on Highway 7, they're scared to death of the curves and the trees because they can't see and they don't have, you know, in Texas, all the roads are straight and there's nothing but prairies out there you can't you, know, you see forever so these folks don't know how to drive up here they need to get out of my way that's too bad hey. <laughs> see there we go but that's being prejudiced towards somebody just because of their license plate that's on their car who knows they might have been raised in arkansas and had to move to texas you know you nobody know. wants to move to texas you have to move to texas but there's lots of different prejudices out there. There's lots of different types of racism. It could be economic status. It, it, it can be appearance, just the way somebody looks. You know, just because somebody has some tattoos. I don't have any tattoos. I don't want any tattoos. But I'm not going to hold it against somebody else if they have a tattoo. <laughs> okay, fine. But don't hold it against me if I choose not to have a tattoo. I mean, you got it, Lane. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Lane listens to his mama. You don't defile the temple. I mean, she's taught him that from an early age. But <clears throat> there's just a lot of different areas that human beings have chosen to hold to hold against other people. A lot of different things that we use to reason as to why we should or shouldn't do something. It'll, we forget that at one time all mankind were pretty much the same and then we had the Tower of Babel where they wanted to build this tower up and they wanted to be like God they wanted to reach the heavens and see God I guess and converse with God and go to the places God goes to and so what did God do? He dispersed the people He caused them all to speak a different language and dispersed them into all parts of the world God created different kinds of people. Who are we to say we know better? I mean, unfortunately, that's what a lot of times we are, particularly the lost, seem to want to think that they've got it all figured out. They know a better way than, than those that are following God's word and God's will. He says, uh, he goes on to say the subject of racism has been quite murky in recent years. Something that is truly racist is encouraged while something that is not racist at all is emphasized. For example, calling homosexuality a sin is not racist. It's sharing what the Bible says. It's, it's telling some, it's just what God's word is. Just like God tells us he created all people and he wants everyone to be saved. That's no different than also... You can't pick and choose the verse that you want to fit what you want your what you want in your life. If God says something that doesn't fit with the 
road you're traveling down, maybe you need to get off that road. Maybe you need to follow God's path. And sharing the gospel with only people that look like us or not allowing certain Christians to join a particular church because of their skin color, that's racist. God doesn't tell us in the Bible to not do that. In fact, he tells us quite the opposite. He tells us to do that. That's when Peter said, I perceive that God is no respecter. He, Peter understands that God doesn't prefer any one person over there. He doesn't. He has, God has no prejudices. And that's what God was telling him when he lowered this sheet and showed him all these animals and said, they're all clean. He's telling him that all of my creation, I want to be saved. He's telling him that every person that walks this earth, I created them. And every person that walks this earth, I wish to hear the gospel. And every person that walks this earth, I wish to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's what God was telling Peter. That's what God was wanting us to understand. Not just to rise, kill, and eat, but that if I say it's clean, it's clean. That's what God's telling us. Uh, Mike? Yes. I've been going to church a long time, and I have never seen a Sunday school lesson like this that taught, mm -hmm. or I had never heard it from the pulpit. Mm -hmm. I mean, that doesn't mean it's wrong. I understand. And when I, my, first, my first reaction to reading this lesson this week is, well, this will probably step on some people's toes. This goes down a road and a path that a lot of people won't like, maybe, or maybe wonder why why we don't talk about this. And I'm thinking, well, how can I how can I navigate this and, and cut off this corner and go this way? And then I stop and I think, well, that's exactly what God's telling Peter not to do here. That's right. That's exactly what God is saying. This isn't my words course it's not y'all's words this is what God's telling us this is what God says and I'm not going to I'm not going to stand before God I, I've got enough questions to answer for okay <laughs> but we might be less prejudiced if we had heard this I, more I, times I fully agree with you because the other thing that comes to my mind is why are we 2,000 years after this being written down and talking about this this should have been something that was taken care of 2,000 years ago, and we were raised up this way, and we were taught this way from, from years ago to the point where it's, how could it be anything else? How could a person think any other way? But we don't live that way. We live, we work, we live in a broken world, Amen. and Satan is doing everything. We've been studying and talking and, and looking at, all the various ways that Satan tries to destroy the church. He just comes up with new ones all the time. And I fully believe that this is one of those, you know, all of the stuff you hear on the news, it's just more of Satan's way. Satan's telling all these lost people that he's encouraging them. Stand up there and say, do all this and say all this and demand all these things. And we'll get to the, I mean, it's in the lesson here. But if we all turn to God and we all accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, can you imagine all of the problems that would not exist in our world? How we could... Heaven's not going to be like this, of course, thankfully. But we still have a... It, it shows us that we still have a tremendous work to do here on this earth before God calls us home. He says we live in a world that calls evil good and good evil and the only solution for racism is the plain application of the Bible. That's what you're saying. That's what I'm trying to say. God is no not a respecter of persons. He does not show favoritism to people based on appearance. God sees people as either saved or lost. That's the bottom line for us. That's the bottom line for God so that should be the bottom line for us. You're either saved or you're lost. Now, here's what's different. When we see people different from us, okay, we have a bottom line. Okay, you're either saved or you're lost. I like things black and white. I like things to either, they're either right or they're wrong. You're saved or you're lost. 
But human nature is that if you're wrong and I'm right, <laughs> the heck with you. I'm right. Yay me. You're wrong. Boo on you. But the difference between us and God is God sees people as either saved or lost, and that is it. This is the only distinction that God makes between his people and the only one that we should make. He desires the lost to be saved and the saved to live holy lives. That's the difference between God that we have to learn and we have to work on every day. Just because somebody's different from us and just because they're lost, we're not to turn our back on them and walk away from them. God doesn't want them to stay lost. That's the thing. He wants them to be saved. He wants all of us to be in his presence in heaven. He does not give up on the lost. So if God doesn't give up on them, we shouldn't give up on them. Just because someone has it wrong doesn't mean we turn away from them. Just because these yahoos in Washington, D.C. that we scream at on the television don't get it and don't, and quite apparent, don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, doesn't mean we should just stand and scream at them and tell them they're wrong. We need to show them what God wants. We need to show them what God's love is. We need to somehow do our part to show them the answer, which is Jesus Christ. So, moving along. Told y'all this was going to be fun today. I'm looking forward for them comments too. Let's see. <laughs> Acts 37 to 42. That word I say you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with the power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. And we were witnesses of all the things which he did in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hung, hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. So we started out this talking about what was going on. Cornelius had sent, because he was asked by an angel of the Lord, to send for Peter at Joppa. And he sent some guys there. And Peter had had this vision. And so Peter followed God's, because God told him to. He followed God's will. And he went to, he went to Cornelius' house. And Cornelius didn't just have him and his immediate family. He invited his friends in there. We've got a missionary coming to preach to us. That's what was going on here. And he brought him into the house. And not only <coughs> did Peter go, Peter took some of the church members with him. Y'all ever, you know, sometimes a missionary travels with others. Sometimes a missionary will travel with people from his church. I grew up in a primitive Baptist church and we had visiting preachers all the time. And a lot of times, there would be people from their church come with them. You get to know a lot of folks that way. You get to know a lot of people in different parts of the country. Yeah, it's always handy when you're traveling to know somebody in the area you're going to in case you need some help or you have some problems. But So he, so he brought people with him. And it says, when Peter entered Cornelius' house, two worlds collided. Peter and his Jewish companions met Cornelius and his Gentile family and friends. They weren't supposed to be together. They weren't supposed to eat together. They weren't supposed to socialize. They weren't supposed to hang out with each other. And here they are, all in the same house. Doing what? Talking about Jesus Christ. Doing what? Following God's will. God told them both this is what he wanted to do. The gospel brought them together. He says, when we get serious about obeying God's word and taking the gospel to all the world, we'll be led to uncomfortable places among people very different from us. But when some of these people accept Jesus Christ as Savior, the differences between us disappear. It is our relationship with God that overcomes all prejudices and unites us. The 
If we truly know Jesus Christ as a Savior, we won't treat people that way. You know, I'm in the job of self. That's what, that's what I do. I'm, I don't actively go out and you know, I'm not the one out on the lot catching the folks. I'm one of the managers that helps to sell them when they have issues or when we get down to the brass tacks of things. Go out and sit down with the customer. And, you know, when someone's wanting, to, when you're making a big purchase, it's always a nervous thing. It, you're always wondering, this person that I'm thinking about buying this from, who are they? Can I trust them? Will they say what they say they will do? Are they telling me what are they are they shooting me straight? And so my job is to go out there and to to, to comfort those those fears, you know, to overcome their objections, to, to give them a little peace of mind that they're making a good decision. They've come to the right place. I'm going to take care of you. But they don't know me and I don't know them. So how can you how can you come together? And to, to build up a little trust with each other. Well, you got to find some common ground. That's the bottom line. That's what they have here. The gospel brought them together. They found some common ground because of, of God and His Word. We, you get to talking to somebody. We live in Arkansas. You can talk to somebody for five minutes, and I promise you, you're either kin to them, or you know somebody that is kin to them, or you, you, you're friends with their friends, or something. You can make some kind of connection. And, you know, what they're really looking for there is someone that can help hold you accountable. If you can, or you know somebody, or if you have some things in common, and things don't go just right, I know not only can I call you, but I can also call a friend who can call you. You know, you're just trying to allow their fears. You find some common ground. And that's what they, that's what it is here. It's a relationship with God that overcomes all prejudice and unites. That's what unites us, is being saved and knowing Jesus Christ as our Savior. He told them, he, what he's telling them here is he's sharing the gospel. It's, this is a neat sermon that he's talking to them about. He says that, He talks about how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with the power. And he went about doing good. And he went about doing miracles and, and to show them that he is who he says he is. He's helping them with the common ground thing. And then there were witnesses. They watched all of this. And, and they saw how the Jews treated him. And they saw how he was hung on the cross and how they killed him. And that they were there and that God raised him up from on the third day. And that they were there in his presence when he walked this earth for 40 days. And they ate and drank with him. <clears throat> and then he said he told him how Jesus' healing ministry pointed him out as a Christ. Peter told him how he witnessed the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that God sent him to tell others about Jesus. He told him that Jesus would be the judge, the, would judge the living and the dead based on this message. He's telling them that here's the bottom line. This Jesus Christ I'm telling you about, he's the man. This is where we can all come together. This is where we can all find that common ground. Jesus Christ, he is the judge. He's got the final say over all of us. It says the gospel is for everyone and we're commanded to take it, to take the gospel to everyone. Jesus Christ is the common ground. Jesus Christ is the bottom line. That's why we're here. We're here to follow God's will. And God's will, as we started this lesson, was His desire for everyone to be saved. That's it. God created all of us, and He gave us all the ability to choose. And God's desire is for us to all choose Him. And we know full well there's a whole lot that have not done that yet. And it doesn't matter if they're our neighbor or if they live across town, across the country, or halfway around the world. If they 
they look like us or if they don't. If they talk like us or if they don't. If they eat the things we eat or they don't. I mean, we were watching Diner Dives and Drive-In last night, and oh my goodness, he was eating Ethiopian food, and he was eating Thai food, and he was eating things that I didn't know you could eat, and a green papaya. I mean, papaya is tough enough to take like it is, because it's just got this, a strange wane to it. But it, it, I like it in small portions. But who on earth would think to eat a green papaya? And he's talking about what a wonderful meal is. Okay. God said it's all for us to eat. Y'all can have that. I'll take something else. <laughs> but just because they eat green papaya doesn't mean I can't share the gospel with them. Just because they live halfway around the world, it's, God wants me to share the gospel with them if, if that's the path that God puts before me. So 43 through 48. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. So, whosoever, we hear that a lot in the Bible. He tells us here, whosoever declares that salvation is available to all who believe. Whosoever is all-encompassing. There is no distinction. There is no separation of anybody there. Whosoever is all of us. The gospel is not restricted to a certain few, but the gospel is available to whosoever. And the gospel also requires a decision. No one can stand between belief and unbelief. You can't stop and say, well, I'm going to... You can't say it's right or wrong. It's black and white. You can't say I'm going to straddle this fence. And when I get to something in the Bible I like, I'm going to hop over on this side. When I get to something that, in the Bible that I don't like, but I want to do, but it's not in the Bible. In fact, the Bible says don't do that. I'm going to hop on the other side of the fence. You, you can't switch sides. You're either saved or you're not. You're either following God's will or you're not. You're either a believer or you're a non-believer. You're either saved or you're lost. And, he tell, and then... So these folks accepted Jesus Christ. And while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. Everybody in the house that wasn't already saved were saved. And they of the circumcision, those Jews that were with Peter, they were astonished. As many as came with Peter, all of them that came with Peter were astonished. Because that on the Gentiles was also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Just like the day of Pentecost. Because some of those folks were there at the day of Pentecost. And they saw the Holy Spirit coming on these people the same as it came on them. But wait, they're Gentiles and we're Jews. And they're learning that God has no prejudices. And they knew it happened because they heard him speak with tongues and magnify God. And then answered Peter. So they heard him speaking in tongues. They heard him speaking in languages that they didn't understand, but they themselves could understand. They heard him speaking in languages that weren't native to them. But and it doesn't explain who they were talking to or what they said, but the same thing the Holy Ghost did on the day of Pentecost is he's doing here to show proof. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Baptism is not your salvation, but baptism is a public declaration of your salvation. So that's what they're saying here. Well, who's going to deny us baptizing these folks? They know Jesus Christ is their Savior. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. They prayed, and then, and then they asked him to stick around for a little while. It says here that God gave visible evidence of the Holy Spirit's coming upon them with speaking in tongues... And after these believers were baptized, they became the first Gentile church and was just as much of a church as the Jerusalem church. So here's another church being planted. Not by a bunch of Jews, but by a bunch of Gentiles. Not by the folks that they originally thought were deserving of Jesus Christ to be their Savior. 
But God's teaching them that everybody is a whosoever. And everybody is who Jesus Christ died for. And then... It's interesting. They started this church. This church was planted. Peter was there. They asked him to stick around. Well, why would they not ask him to stick around? They're new to this game. They're new to knowing Jesus Christ. They've heard this, but, you know, we'd like to know a little more. We'd like to know. So they asked him to stay around so they could get started off on the right foot. So they could start their church in a proper manner. And, and not get just you know, not take the wrong path. But it's interesting, when Peter did go back, then those Jews that weren't there to witness all this, they kind of start questioning Peter about what was said and what happened. People will start questioning us. People will start questioning us whether or not we should be talking to these people, whether or not we should be sharing the gospel with these people. These people are so far gone, you're wasting your time. No. God told me that he wants everyone to be saved. Peter's answer should be our answer. In eleven seventeen. if therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? If this is God's desire, who am I to stand against God? If God wants them to be saved, who am I to say they don't deserve to be saved? We know that God wants everyone to be saved. So who are we to stand against God and His will? Who are we to stand up and say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm saved. I know Jesus Christ is my Savior. And uh, I believe most of this Bible. You know, but times have changed a little bit. It's 2,000 years later. And we're in a new day and age. Things are a little different. So these things don't really apply today to us like they did back then. Well, that's hogwash. That's not so. You're either saved or you're lost. You either believe or you don't. It's black and white. God put all his word in. It's, it's amazing how timeless his word is. We've talked about this before. Mankind cannot write down anything that 20 years later we feel the same about it as we did 20 years ago and it'd be as timely as it was 20 years ago and as interesting as it was 20 years ago. We might go back and read it just to know where we were at 20 years ago. But the word was written down from 2,000 to 6,000 years ago. And it's amazing because it's God's word. Man wrote it down, but they were inspired. They were told by God what to write down. And it's as applicable today as it was then. Now, <clears throat> why have we not talked about all these things for the past 2,000 years? I, I don't know. That's something that the people that came before me will have to answer to. The people that came before us will have to answer to. The people that, de de that believed and taught differently than us before us will have to answer to. It's not for us to to judge them and it's not for us to defend them. What we're to do is what God's will is and what he calls on us to do and what he lays before us and what his word tells us to do. Because we got enough to answer for without having to take on somebody else's baggage. He says in closing, I'm very thankful that God sent Peter to the Gentiles to share the gospel. I am thankful that God is not just the God of the Jews, but also of the Gentiles and did not limit the gospel to the Jews only. I am thankful that God always had in his plan of salvation to save both the Jews and the Gentiles because I am a Gentile. Are we not so thankful that Peter didn't show prejudice and tell God they don't deserve it? <coughs> God probably would have found somebody. Not probably. He would have found somebody else because that's his will for us to all be saved. But, you know, a lot of times we get to, if, if we travel down that path of prejudice, if we're not real careful, we'll find out that we're on the opposite side that we thought we were on. 
You know, we've been talking about all these things because we're thinking all along that we're on Peter's side. We're one of Peter's people. We're not one of Peter's people. We're one of Cornelius' people. We weren't born Jews. We're not one of God's chosen people, the Jewish people, the Israelites. We're Gentiles. That reminds me of Jonah. Exactly. He told the Lord that the people in Nineveh didn't deserve to be he saved. He told them they didn't deserve they didn't deserve his grace. They didn't deserve God. And he showed him otherwise. <laughs> the Jews were pre prejudiced against the Gentiles then, and God said it was wrong. So we Gentiles cannot be prejudiced against Jews or any other group of people and think God condones our prejudice. God is no respecter of persons, and we are not to be either. We are not to put any people above any other. We're not to put ourselves above anybody else. Do we limit church membership to only those who look like us or live in the nicer neighborhoods? Are we obedient to the Lord's command when he told us to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Are we obedient to the Lord when he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost? We cannot be racist or prejudiced and obey the Lord's commands. When one is lost, regardless of of which side of the debate they're on, you see them on, you see, they always see the other person as unworthy. When you see two people arguing, and it's obvious that when you're listening to their discussions that one or both of them are lost because of what they're saying and what they're using, it, it becomes evident to you. They don't know grace. They don't know God's grace. And the thing is, the cross is the great equalizer. The cross is the great equalizer for all of us, and it's the gospel that will bring us together, just like what we saw here with Cornelius and Peter. It's the gospel that brought them together, not just because they heard about each other. It was because of what they each needed to, to know and to share. The cross. That's what we're to teach. We're to teach the cross and see how the gospel will bring us together with all those around us. And with that, I'd like for us to go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. So thankful, Lord, for Jesus Christ. So thankful for his work on the cross. So thankful, Lord, that you do not give up on us, nor anyone else. But it's your desire for all to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. I just pray, Lord, that as individuals and as Mount Zion as a church, as your church, and through her ministries that we reach out into all the world around us that you've placed before us, all the different avenues that you seek and you desire for us to traverse, that we will share that with all those around us, that Jesus Christ is the answer, that Jesus Christ is what will bring us all together, and that that is your will for our lives and theirs as well. I ask forgiveness for our failure in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.